Welcome to Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. I'm your host, Jason Falls. And something decided to land in my throat as I said that. Ah, here we go. Today on the program, we're going to explore the evolution of a brand. Tastes of Chicago is a prime example of a brand that has come through a digital transformation. And Aheem Thomas, its chief revenue officer, has been calling most of the shots during that evolution. He's here today to tell us the Tastes of Chicago story, explain how what used to be a classic sort of catalog business almost, direct to consumer, became a top priority for the Lou Malnati's group of businesses. He also has some neat experiences with influencers and student athletes. I interviewed him for my recent piece for Entrepreneur on that topic. So we'll talk about that as well. But the bigger story today is Tastes of Chicago's path to becoming a big damn deal on the interwebs. So stay tuned for that. Before we get to that in the program, let's talk about podcasts a little bit, though. Some of you are joining us on the live stream this morning. Thank you for doing so. In fact, I'm looking over uh, and wow, I'm not seeing anybody yet. We might be having some technical difficulties, but we're going to persevere uh, because we want to make sure that we're uh, keeping on schedule here. Um, I'll try to tinker here in the background in a minute to see if we can't get online. But um, some of you are joining us a lot on the live stream this morning. Thank you for doing so. But many of you are listening to the recording on the Digging Deeper podcast on demand wherever you listen to podcasts. Did you know that if you do, you are one of 100 million Americans each month that listen to podcasts for your business or if you're at an agency, your client's business? Ignoring podcasts as a method to reach an audience is not only is, is not smart. But podcasts are hard to find, hard to track, and nearly impossible to find uh, reliable audience size and demographic information to know which podcasts to sponsor or to pitch for earned media, right? Well, not anymore. Podchaser Pro is the professional version of Podchaser, which helps anyone find, manage, rate, and follow podcasts. I think of it as an IMDB for podcasts. You don't have to clutter your podcast app with a bunch of subscriptions you never listen to. Podchaser helps you find and manage them like you're subscribing to blogs all in one place. Uh, Podchaser Pro, however, gives you access to that critical audience information you need for media planning and buying or public relations or influencer outreach to podcasts. You find a podcast, click on the Pro tab and see everything you need right there. There's, uh, if there's a piece of information you don't see or can't find, Podchaser Pro subscribers have a personal concierge. You just ask them to go find it. Within a day or two, they get back to you. I've used Podchaser Pro uh, for uh, to make recommendations for media buys and sponsorships to clients here at Cornette. I've also used it to prioritize podcasts for pitching guests and trying to be a part of the show itself. It's a must-have tool for finding, prioritizing, targeting, and tracking podcasts for your business or your clients. If your brand or agency would like to find out more, go to podchaserpro.com slash falls. Sign up there and make your podcast outreach and media planning more effective. That's podchaserpro.com slash falls. Gang, if you are uh, dialing into the live broadcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, you can jump in the comment section there or hit at reply on Twitter to ask questions and interact with us here on the show. Jump into the comments and say hello to ask your question. I'll do my best to surface it so we can answer as we go along. All right, and uh, I'm gonna check the plumbing here for some reason. Uh, the plumbing's not looking like it's working today, so we're gonna have to post a recording of the show after the fact. Everything's coming in to restream just fine, but for whatever reason, the various channels don't seem to be working, so I'll toggle them off and back on one more time just to see if we can get a little pulse over there, but if not, no worries. We'll just post the recording uh, after we're done here. Okay. Uh, Aheem Thomas is here, folks. He is the Chief Revenue Officer at Taste of Chicago, an e-commerce brand that reconnects those who love good Chicago-style pizza but can't get it where they are. But that brand, I think a few years ago, was you know not, not necessarily an afterthought, but down the priority list for the Lou Malnati family of brands. Then, then COVID came and Taste of Chicago's digital transformation followed. Aheem, good morning to you. Uh, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great, although uh, it's awkward to be the guest that killed the podcast stream. So. <laughs> oh, I would, I definitely wouldn't say that. I think uh, everything's fine. Actually, um, the, I'm having an error on one screen, but I'm seeing people commenting on the other. So it's working. I just am not aware that it's working because Izzy House, who's our guest next week, says hello. Uh, Taja McQueen is on our, our team here uh, at Cornette. She says hello as well. So I've probably stopped and started people unnecessarily, but they're there. So, <laughs> well, this is all part of our plan to cry. It, it, it's just, it's playing to the crowd. 
people it is. out there, let us know. Call it us, is. Up the phone lines. It was. It was all BS. I was just seeing if anybody would comment. No, I'm kidding. Um, that you know, technology's grand sometimes, and and I look over and see, oh, nothing's connected. It says offline. Oh my gosh! But it's connected. It's just fine. <sighs> Fun times. So uh, let's set the stage here. I mean, give us a, a little background on. First, the Lou Malnati family of brands. I think people who have been to Chicago or certainly who are from Chicago know that name very, very well. Tell us a little bit about those brands and where Taste of Chicago sort of grew into that. Yeah, and thank you. And great, again, great to be here. Good to see you again. Um, so let's start the story with the Lou Malnati organization or the Malnati organization. 50 years old this year, which is mind boggling. Um, today, we started in Chicago uh, and Lou uh, had the first pizzeria in, in downtown Chicago. Um, we are today 50 years old, 65 some odd restaurants across four states, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Arizona, and now Indiana. Um, so, you know, an ex expanded pizzeria, iconic on the Chicago deep dish uh, scene. What I like to say is if you're looking at a list of deep, deep dish pizzas and, and Lou Malnati's is not in the top three, you got the wrong list. Um, now, and to the, those other two, yeah, you know, you guys make a nice casserole. Um, but uh, <laughs> we've, been, we've been part of the Chicago food fabric for half a century. Okay, great. Uh, then 30 years ago, people coming in and out of Chicago say, well, listen, I live, I live down in Georgia and I love my pizza and I can only get it when I come into town. So can we do something about that? And so what was then called priority pizza was started 30 years ago as a, as a catalog and phone business, right? Which is basically what you did 30 years ago to, to go direct to <laughs> consumer. Yep. Um, pretty quickly as we said, okay, if we're going to put our names on this thing, it better be the right quality. It better be the authentic thing. And, and that's a challenge because in our restaurants, you know, we have incredible ovens, um, and, and we have an incredible staff. Those are the sorts of things most people don't have in their kitchen. So how do we translate that restaurant experience into your in-home, probably non-calibrated oven? Um, <laughs> And as you work through those beats, you say, okay, we're willing to put our name on it. And how do we ship it? How does it stay frozen? How does it reheat perfectly? All, all that stuff. Okay, so we got it. We have to, and that then drives a really interesting and nuanced fulfillment facility. You know, I'm the chief revenue officer. I get to do the banner ads and the, and, and the shows. But in the end, a lot of this is that, that not even just last mile, just making sure you get it and you get it right. Right. So you got to build that up. That's a capital expense. Um, and as we do that, then other great Chicago brands, because we are part of the community, they say, well, wait a minute, y'all can ship your food. Why don't you ship our food? And Chicago is like a lot, a lot of great cities. It's a big city, but a small town. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have a partner that you've grown up with, uh, you know, across the street, across the neighborhood, and you can then trust them with your brand. And that's what, what th then we become Taste of Chicago because the other iconic producers and purveyors say, we can trust Lou Malnati's. There are other companies out there trying to do something like this. And, you know, I don't know if they're going to do right by my brand and my customers. That's interesting. It's, a, it's an interesting sort of um, way to describe a community, a social network, if you will, um, that existed in the old world before, you know, the new world of the internet uh, came about. It's, you know, people who are sort of, not really. I mean, they're competitors, but, uh, you know, the word that we've, I guess, coined in the last few years is coopetition. You know, people who yep. are looking for the same goal, but they uh, and they might be looking at the same audience, but they know that what's good for, you know, the goose is good for the gander. And so everybody collaborates together. That's a uh, that's a unique environment. I don't think you see that in very many, especially big cities. No, and, you know, in food, we get to talk about share and belly, which is always a favorite. Uh, the, but you don't see that in a lot of markets, and in, but in food and, and in a community, you frequently see it, right? right? It's the rising tide thing. Um, and one of the beautiful things about the Chicago community is there is that, that sense of community. Yeah, you know, look, we, we are a for-profit enterprise, right? <laughs> but we understand that we get to make money when we deliver a great experience, a great emotional connection for the customer. Right. So that's a fair game. Let's all just play it and see what we can do. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well, when you talk about share of belly, I've, I've got a considerable one to share. So uh, I'm going to be dialing me up some tastes of Chicago and, and seeing what the other brands you guys work with out there to see what my favorite kind is. I'm not a Chicago style pizza guy, but I love pizza. So I'll try anything. So we'll see, see what happens. All right. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, COVID hits and all of a sudden people aren't going out to eat. They're ordering food in and they're doing it online. How did that consumer shift change things for Taste of Chicago? Yeah. And so a uh, great question. And, and it, gosh, COVID hits a couple of years ago is just an amazing thing to say. Um, so let's, let's go back to 20. We went 30 years ago, right? We got priority pizza. Now let's go back to 2019. We have a nice little business. It's growing at 10, 15% a year at the enterprise level. We have an, an enterprise level marketing team, which says, Hey, you know, we got it. We got a, our, our growing and thriving chain of restaurants to support. And we got this nice little website. And obviously, the two things are related. 80% of our sales uh, come from uh, selling Mumal Nadi's pizza. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, then COVID hits, and we see a couple interesting things happen. And demand shoots through the roof. Um, anecdotal, it's hard for us to, add, you know, the, the surveys we're, we're taking, I wouldn't consider scientific. But uh, anecdotally, what we see is both the obvious combination of, hey, I'm, I'm locked down. So, you know, let's get some food, let's have some adventure. But also now I'm starting to understand that great experiences can be delivered online, right? I think, I think for probably a lot of the listeners of the show and certainly for me, it's like, yeah, I've been ordering food over the internet since forever. But last, in 2020, for a lot of folks, it's, wait a minute, people are shipping great food. And I love pizza. And it, Jason, there, there are no people who dislike deep dish. They're just people who haven't had the right one yet. Gotcha. Um, That's fair. And, That's fair. <laughs> but I like pizza and I like food and I like stories. Let me go find the story. And so in 2020, our business triples. And for a company that is trying to ship a physical product, fresh, flash frozen to your doorstep, when we're in lockdown for volume and then mm. our supply chain is in lockdown mm -hmm. for for volume to triple virtually overnight and for us to be able to not only satisfy that demand, but again, we're delivering experiences and emotional connections. It's got to be right. Quality there. You know, I, I've worked in software. You're like, ah, oh, ship, ship the bug. We'll fix it. That We don't ship bugs literally or metaphorically. <laughs> I uh, hope not. That. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my PR guy's going to kill me after that one. Uh -huh. uh, but, but, uh, uh, we, you, you got to get it right. Every package, you know, it is an independent thing that mm -hmm. all the customer knows is, is, Hey, was it, was it fresh when it got to me? Yeah. Um, so, so for all the digital transformation that we're going through now, because our business tripled and, and we, we have a scale on our hands that, um, that, you know, probably wasn't going to happen otherwise for about 10, 15 years. Um, I like to emphasize it starts with the people doing the right thing. And in any physical goods business, having the people and the fulfillment infrastructure that could tolerate tripling overnight, that, that makes no sense because you don't build to that, right? That's, that's insurance. But again, that just speaks to a, hey, we're in it together. We're going to do right by the customer. Let's figure this out. Um, and it also speaks to the Malnati organization. So our restaurants are closed down and, and for the people, you know, as the pandemic progressed, obviously for the people that did want to return to work, well, the restaurants are closed, but we got it. We we're do adding extra shifts and extra lines in the warehouse. So y'all want to come on down. We can work here. Wow. That's um, a, I never really thought about that, but it's interesting that you did have the type of organization, the breadth and depth of an organization that you probably didn't suffer when your employees probably didn't suffer as much as some other restaurant chains and businesses, right? Yeah, we, we, we think of it as weatherproof, but yeah, we, we, we've been able to support our team in ways that most businesses haven't been able to. And part of that is, look, Mark Malnati is uh, one of Lou's two sons. Rick is the other one. Both are very active in our business. Mark is our chairman. Mm -hmm. And while investors have come in over the years, Mark is still our chairman. We still treat this in, in those ways as if it's an extended family. And a lot of people will talk about culture, 
once you get to 5,000, 6,000 team members, you, you know, usually cultures in most places become the PowerPoint slide that we all ignore after the day two orientation. Yep. Um, but we have a culture that is enforced from the top where uh, as we operate, we actually anchor to, are we doing this on our brand, on our culture? And when you have that ability top down, beautiful things can happen. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I wanted to ask a question, you know, yesterday uh, the world uh, got to experience a few hours without uh, the Zuckerberg behemoths of, of social networks. Um, and when you were talking about the supply chain and whatnot during COVID, it made me sort of think, what happens to a business like yours if Amazon and UPS and uh, DHL and FedEx have issues? Like, do you guys just, is that like, that's your death knell right there? Yeah, so we have some critical points in our supply chain. And if the common carriers have issues, um, we can't ship, right? We do not have our own um, shipping capacity. And, and from a scale standpoint, that wouldn't make sense. Right. So it, it more, you know, is FedEx going to go down? Fairly unlikely. Is uh, uh, what happened, you know, hurricanes, storms in New York, or floods in New York, you know, horrifying things that prevent the, the fulfillment chain from moving. Are, are those things going to happen? Absolutely. So what we need to do is build our relationships and what we do with the carriers, with you, the UPSs of the world and say, look, we, as, as those uh, acts of God, natural occurrences happen, we need to know how y'all, how your chain is working. We need to be your partner. Mm -hmm. And if you're telling me, Hey, look, we're not going into Manhattan this week. That just isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. Then then on our end, if we have that relationship with you where we can just be honest about the problem with each other, then we can go back upstream to our yeah. customers. Yeah. And we then pull down all the, we look at the zip codes and say, look, you know, hey, this thing's supposed to ship this week, but it, we can put it on the truck. That is an option for us. <laughs> but what's going to happen is it's going to stay in the fulfillment facility. We got yeah. dry ice can last for three days in our shipping container. Yeah. And this thing's going to take five. Now we have a hundred percent satisfaction guarantee, so we'll reship it to you. So you know, it isn't going to cost you any more money. But of all the things you're dealing with on the upper Upper West Side, this thing doesn't feel like one of them. So let us know if you wanted just to, us to hold the shipment. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. And you're right; the relationship with the consumer is really critical there. Speaking of consumers, uh, Shane Chaps is a frequent uh, a viewer of the show. And she says that uh, we've ordered Lou Malnati's for my birthday from Taste of Chicago. I love deep dish. Not that I'm knocking New York pizza. I think she's from up in, <laughs> in that, that area. But she says we love pizza, especially pizza not from here. She lives in Louisville, so she's probably referring to Papa John's. I won't put words mm -hmm. in her mouth, but, you know, when people think of Louisville and pizza, they forget that we've got a couple of nice gourmet places in town, just like Chicago does. But when yeah. they think of Louisville and pizza, they typically think of Papa John's, which is meh, it's all right. Anyway, um, all right. So you you you're brought in a few years ago to lead digital transformation. Now I'm looking at your resume and I see a lot of tech. I see a lot of investment company type situations. Uh, not pizza. Not really even primarily e-commerce. I don't think. What did you bring to the table from your experiences to help engineer all this? Well, what, the way the way I'm a marketer and so I know how to position myself. Um, so I, I I think of myself <laughs> as a as a marketing athlete. Um, which is I, I excel, my, my talents lie in, in being able to cr operate across uh, the all aspects of the marketing discipline. Um, you know, on any one thing, if we're talking performance marketing, if we're talking, you know, deep, uh, how do we attribute uh, traffic coming in and out of Facebook? Um, you know, we want to get the experts in place. Um, but generally, I'm fluent in, in those aspects of the discipline. And so the way then I, I think about that is I say, well, okay, now I care about marketing. I care about being able to manifest stories that solve customer problems. And prior to joining the Malnati organization, uh, almost a year ago, um, I was at a company called Backblaze, a great cloud storage and computer backup company. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they, I remember being interviewed there and they said, well, why do you want to work at a cloud storage company? And I said, oh, I, I don't. And if the next candidate that walks in here has been, she's been dreaming about object, distributed object storage since the age of three, you should definitely hire her. But short of that, 
I look at this as a wonderful challenge uh, and ultimately trying to deliver products that solve some sort of problem in the customer's life. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been proud in my career, certainly in the last uh, decade or so, to be able to select companies where I can believe in the product. Nice. And, and the minute uh, I, I came across the team at the Mount Lauder organization and then had the product, I, I was, I was, candidly gonna take about the take this year off um uh, it'd be a great run at backways and a little tired got two little kids gonna hang out and do some finger painting um but i met the team and tried the product and just said what do i need to do to become part of this team um, nice yeah and i'm fortunate enough that, uh, that i found a way no, that's great. Well, uh, you're, 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 you know, I was going to take your off thing where my, I just finished up daddy daycare last night with a couple of, with my girlfriend's kids. So, uh, it's right in line with where you were headed, but I'm glad you found a place. And, and certainly I'm sure your kids probably enjoy the benefits, the perks of bringing home pizza too. Um, oh, they, well, they are, they are, um, frequently, uh, in our taste of Chicago ads, little kids eating pizza, <laughs> get a lot of clicks. So, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that my, that I'll be paying for that when they're teenagers, but for now it's, it's working great. Yeah. I tried, I tried that with my kids and my son was always like hip to my BS. He was like, I'm not being in your damn commercials. Nope. I'm not going to do it. So anyway, um, so you come in and bring some uh, data wonkery to the table. Where do you start? What's the first set of data you're looking at to start to put the pieces together to transform a new business, any business, not just Taste of Chicago, but where do you begin? Yeah, I so, said, uh, where that's a, actually, I was about to say, oh, in Taste of Chicago, it ended up being pretty easy because my boss told me the answer. And then I looked at him like, oh, great, you're right, fantastic. Um, so, so let, let, but, but in a vacuum from a process standpoint, it, it sounds trite, but it, but it is a lot of listening. It is pretty rare that the symptoms of the problem are unknown. The team feels it every day. And one of the reasons it j tends to remain a problem is the, a, a lot of folks that really understand the symptoms and you got to play the, the, you know, the five, ask five whys and get to the actual problem, the actual, I, w I don't want to call it disease, but the, the, my metaphor then is, is now stretched. Um, <laughs> and, and so at a company in, in, this, in this case and in my last few organizations, it actually, the, the challenges faced by the team were screaming out. And, you know, today, a lot of the problems come in around data, data capture, data transformation, data usage. But, okay, great. We got a data problem. Fantastic. Let's make the PowerPoint raise $300 million. Uh, the, the challenge then, but there's certainly a technical challenge. This stuff is non-trivial. Non Right. But it's also a trade off between, you know, how are we actually going to use this? And am I embarking on a four year odyssey before I prove any value that my friends are going to be super pumped on that we got to go play with? But in the end, it didn't didn't create any value in the business's um, life. Um, how do you balance those needs in very complicated problems? You know, that that's where the art and the science can lead to some wonderful things. Right. I know you like to uh, to test and iterate with new ideas and avenues and whatnot. Is there anything you tried uh, in the, the e-commerce food category that you hadn't you know done before, obviously, because you had been in that category um, that you maybe you thought would work, but didn't or vice versa that you thought wouldn't work, but did any any aha moments for you? Uh, the, the, the list of my failures or <laughs> we're going to need more tape. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, I do, I do prefer talking about our failures. Um, you know, I think the, the ones that I have, I, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm stalling. I think it's something tactical. Um, but the, the common thread, uh, that I see is, you know, sins of effort and ambition. Yeah. You know, oh, we can get all this done in two, three months. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, um, that, that tends to, it's unfortunate because on the one hand, if you, you want to try hard and you want to make sure you're failing some percentage of the time, um, cause I'd rather fail 10% of the time, which means I maximize the things I could do today. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm trying to think of a, a, a recent spectacular failure, but let me talk about, uh, an early experiment in personalization that we did. Uh, I, I ran actually a direct to consumer uh, wine marketplace for a while. Okay, and 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 this speaks to the the collaboration among competitors. 
So what we were, we had a marketplace of, uh, it was one third of U.S. wineries. And on an anonymized uh, basis, we were uh, gathering first party data from the winery's website. And what we then did is the first programmatic display for alcohol in the U.S. Well, when you have the data, any one data set from a winery is so small that it can't become predictive. Right. Wineries sell three, five types of wine. Consumers generally like to drink what they like to drink. And so the challenge is, okay, can we aggregate that data set? Can we then interpret it so we can understand that? Well, Anderson Valley Pinot Noir drinkers, do they really care about Duckhorn? Mm -hmm. Or do they care about $40 wines that have hints of Coca-Cola in? (laughs) <laughs> um, and, and it, by the way, in the duck horn case, it, it turns out there was a lot more brand affinity than there was a you know, kind of product, uh, relationships. Um, so, so you, act, you, this speaks to the earlier thing. Okay. So there's just ton of data. Let's have some finite hypothesis. And in this case it was, Hey, is this about a common set of brands or is this about new, you know, we really need to understand the nuances of all the different types of Pinot. Well, when you have that larger data set, you can actually look backwards at what customers are already doing and see if that and see what that is, what that ends up driving. And this is, you know, when advertising is a beautiful thing, our ads were destructingly effective because (laughs) because what I can do is I can say, hey, you know, people like you drink things like this. Mm -hmm. You're interested. I can also when and in a lot of ways, people aren't conscious of their preference set, particularly in categories where they may not know a ton about. Right. And so we then were able to transform those broad based insights to our support team. And so when someone picked up the phone and said, well, you know, the last thing I, I, I really enjoy was this Pinot, uh, our support reps, you know, very simple, ugly search, but effectively just type into a little search box. Pinot Noir, Anderson Valley, and I know this thing's 45 bucks, what what comes back? And it gives the support rep a place to start the journey with the customer. Nice. Super smart. Super smart. Um, Speaking of super smart, and I I, want to touch on this before we wrap up because uh, A, I said I would, and B, I loved what your perspective was on it. We talked about influencer marketing a couple of weeks ago for the piece I wrote for uh, Entrepreneur. I appreciate your contribution there, obviously. I know you've started to dive into um, influencer marketing from the perspective of using the name image likeness uh, opportunity to work with student athletes. And, you know, being Taste of Chicago, that makes perfect sense. I think your strategy is pretty straightforward is find people who are from Chicago or have some tie to Chicago that are not in Chicago anymore and partner with them to say, hey, come have Taste of Chicago. That makes perfect sense, very logical. But you brought up an interesting uh, issue that you think we're going to have to tackle in the student athlete name image likeness thing. And I'd love to tap into that and have you share more of that with folks today. What are the what are the landmines that we need to be watching out for if we are brands jumping into the NIL partnerships with student athletes? Yeah, uh, and this will, this is great because it lets me loop back to the Louisville food scene, which is outstanding. And there are some great pizza places. And look, Papa John's for what it is, it's kind of like Budweiser, right? Yep. Pro- producing at that scale, at that cost, it's a bit of a miracle. Yep. Um, so l- let's pick on Papa John's for a little while, shall we? Okay, great. Sure. Um, let's go. <laughs> so some of the challenges in, in the Wild West out here, um, as a business, and this certainly happened in our early kickoff meetings, which is great. This is going to be awesome because we're going to reach out to athletes. And what we found out is it turns out college kids like free pizza. So we got something that, that they want. Fantastic. Um, so, so then we say, okay, well, we, you know, the very natural instinct is to say, okay, what we got to do is lock up the ability to use their content they produce for us, their posts in perpetuity, right? Because some of these athletes are going to, in this case, make the NFL. And when they become, you know, first round draft pick, hopefully the Bears, then we're going to be great. We're going to have this thing, this endorsement that was effectively free from two years ago. This is going to be amazing. We're geniuses. Except here's the problem. That athlete, you know, when he makes, ma- makes it as a first round pick, maybe Papa John's comes knocking. And yeah, we're a great company and you want your brand associated with ours. Uh, Papa John's might offer you five million bucks. 
And you might want to cash that check. And I got no quarrel with that. Hmm. Except Papa John's lawyers then are going to be looking backwards and say, well, wait a minute, you got this perpetual image deal with, with the Malnati organization. They sell pizza, we sell pizza. Now, we're not direct competitors with Papa John's, but if I was over at Papa John's, I'd be like, hey, like I, I can't sink money into your brand and have this and have the Malnati's benefiting from it. Yep. Um, and now all of a sudden, what's really happened there? Uh, what, what's really happened is we've inhibited the athlete's ability to earn. And that actually literally runs counter to what we're trying to do with NIL, which is, hey, you know, we got hardworking athletes. And yes, scholarships are valuable things. But in general, those athletes are generating more value than their scholarship is worth. So can we get them fed? Yeah. Is that, that going to be okay? Um, but let me pause. So, so one thing we're worried about is um, we think in this Wild West scenario, there will be intentionally predatory brands out there. Now, the good news is we just know we're not. Yeah. But the thing we're worried about is the being unintentionally predatory. Yeah. If I lock somebody up forever and ever, I, I may unintentionally hurt their ability to earn downstream. That, that ain't right. right. So, so we're structuring our program thinking through the athlete's experience because in the, and it's easier for a hospitality company because we're used to thinking through the, the guests, the customer's experience. Right. Well, I, I applaud you for, for that, for a recognizing that and talking about it publicly because a lot of brands who are predatory or, you know, are all about the bottom line and we're always going to do what's best for the company, regardless of, of who it steps on or hurts. I think a lot of brands out there are actually maybe even going to hear this conversation and say, Ooh, let's put perpetuity in our contracts because that locks these people up forever. And we can always use the image when the yeah. right thing to do is probably, Hey, let's lock their image rights up until they, you know, leave the institution and they're, they've moved on to a professional career or something that might be a little bit more fair while you're at the university of Kentucky or the university of Wisconsin or wherever, um, we want, you know, your image rights to be able to say, Hey, this university of Kentucky star loves our pizza or whatever. That's right. But when, but when they move on to something else, then let's the image rights go away and you know, now they can, they're free to, to earn it elsewhere. I, I love the fact that you're, you're talking about that and putting that idea out there, but I think there's a lot of brands out there that are probably going to unfortunately intentionally take advantage of student athletes. So that's something for not only for brands to be aware of, and hopefully they don't do it. But for student athletes, influencers, their parents, coaches, et cetera, to also be aware of as well. Yeah. And if I could, a uh, 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 warning and admonition to those brands, which is <laughs> let, let's let's set aside the integrity and the long term aspects of what we're talking about. Now, I'm so grateful to be at the Malnati organization where we th we are able after a half a century, we are able to think for the long term right. and doing the right thing in this capacity is clearly and unambiguously in our long-term interests. Yeah. But let's set that aside. If you're at, you know, kind of a quick hit brand uh, in that situation, the thing I would caution you about is the day of reckoning is coming because somebody is doing this right now. And within 12 months, that athlete's going to make the pros that at, within then 18 months, that athlete's going to have this endorsement conflict. And then we're going to be in the social media fight. And what you did today is going, you know, light's going to get shine on it 18 months from now. And there is going to be a sweep of everybody in this game. Yep. And we'll, we'll be judged on our actions today. Yep. So if nothing else, you're going to get caught. Well, and I would also say too, if you are a local business or if you're a small er business and you want a fight with, professional sports agents and Papa John's pizza size brands and professional sports teams or leagues, you're dead. You're just dead. Oh, <laughs> you're dead. And, and, and Jason, we for, we forgot about mom and dad. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want that fight and I, mm -hmm. I don't want it anywhere. I don't want it in my living room and I sure as heck don't want it on Twitter. Yeah, no doubt. I had I had the good fortune, I'll say, overall of, of working in college athletics for 15 years. But I also had the bad fortune of having to deal with some pretty testy parents 
of student athletes a few times. Had one like doing poking me in the chest, telling this is how you hurt her. Like actually physically, I was like, all right, this is going to get out of hand if you don't leave. Yeah, it's going to end badly. <laughs> oh, that was fun. Anyway, well, uh, I hate super having you here. I love these perspectives. I love the fact that you're pursuing this conversation. I love what you guys are doing as well. Uh, if you want people to uh, find you, connect with you, or if you want people to order a pizza on them, their interwebs, tell us how to find you. I uh, appreciate, appreciate the plug. So our website is tastesofchicago.com. Um, and that'll be in the show notes. And as of uh, noon Eastern today, mm. uh, the digging deeper coupon code will get you 10% off any purchase uh, for the rest of the week. Awesome. Uh, my apologies. My apologies is right as we were going on air. I was like, I forgot to hit send on that email. <laughs> so I'm going to need about 20 minutes. <laughs> This thing's on delay, right? I think uh, I think we can wait 20 minutes to order our pizzas. Yeah, sure. No problem. D Digging Deeper is going to be uh, live in just a moment here. Um, and yeah, anybody that's interested in, in the topics we covered today, um, love to chat. LinkedIn or, or Twitter is the best way to get me. And with a name like Aheen, A-H-I-N, I'm a pretty easy guy to find. That's true. I've dubbed the links to your LinkedIn and to, uh, uh, oops, I've got the wrong link there for uh, Takes to Chicago. That's last week's link, but I'll put that in the show notes and make sure that I correct that here in a minute. Let's do it. HTTPS colon uh, tastes of Chicago.com. Live PB is amazing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's fantastic. Now the correct link is in the daggone uh, comment section wherever you are. And if it's not there, you can find it over at Team Cornette. Aheen, thank you so much for the time, man. Great insights, great conversation. Uh, best of luck continuing the digital transformation and growth of Taste of Chicago. And I look forward to catching up again soon. Glad, glad to have Aheen on the show. And uh, Digging Deeper coupon code is going live in a few minutes here, folks. So tasteofchicago.com, get you 10% off one of those pizzas. I know I'm going to be ordering some. So I got I got I got to feed kids this weekend. So that's all good. All right. Uh, next week on the big show, we're going to spend some time with one of our own and celebrate the book launch of longtime viewer and commenter Izzy House. Her new book, Space Marketing, launched on Friday. I'm about halfway through it. I'm loving it so far. We're finally going to meet uh, Izzy in the reels here on Digging Deeper and talk about the marketing of space. There's a surprising backstory behind the stories we know of Apollo, Sputnik, the shuttles, and so on. So, Tune in next Tuesday, October 12th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Time. If you can't be there live, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Cornette Online slash Cornette.online slash Dig Deep. There's the button that puts that up on the screen for you. Um, and, of course, if you uh, can't, uh, don't have time to check out the YouTube channel and watch it, uh, you can subscribe to the audio feed via podcast over at cornet.online slash digging deeper. That'll take you to a page where you can subscribe uh, to uh, Apple podcasts or Google podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Stitcher's on there as well. So you can go over there and subscribe to the audio feed. That way you don't miss anything. By the way, if you do subscribe to an audio feed on one of your uh, podcast apps, or if you watch the YouTube channel, uh, love it if you'd go over there and give us a, a review, a like or something to uh, make sure that uh, people see and find the show a little easier so that they can hear some of the great conversations we have here on Digging Deeper. So go to cornet.online slash digging deeper uh, to get to those podcast page links and drop us a little review if you don't mind. We certainly would appreciate that. That always helps the podcasts grow. And uh, real quickly before we go. Uh, I, I want to make sure everyone knows the uh, Winfluence, uh, the book, is is doing doing well. Uh, we have the, uh, the we still have the coupon code up. If you want to go get that, you can go to jason.online slash buy Winfluence uh, and use the code falls20 and get 20% off. That's buying it directly from Entrepreneur Press, my publisher. And so you get the best price there and you get the 20% discount. That's where I can you know, sort of, I can't, I don't really control it, but I can ask them for the discount and it's still there. So falls 20, get you 20% off the retail price of the book. Would love for you to, to, to get a copy of the book if you haven't already. Uh, and uh, give me your feedback on that. Hopefully it'll uh, have some great ideas for you, for your influencer marketing efforts. And then if you are an audio file, if you'd rather listen, um, I actually narrate the audio book and the audio book is available at jason.online slash audiobook that will take you directly to the page on audible.com where you can uh, download or connect the book to your audible app and you can listen to me talk 
and read the book to you for seven and a half hours, which uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. I think, of course it's my voice, so I'm going to think it's awesome, but you know, I think you'll enjoy it. And if that's the way you like to consume your books these days, uh, it is there. And I got to narrate it myself. So awfully proud of that. I was a little nervous. They weren't going to let me do it, but apparently, apparently my voice sounds pleasant enough for them to let me narrate my own book. I didn't do it quite in this voice, but it's good, for, good enough for everyone to listen to. So there you go. Jason.online slash audiobook. And now, as of course, uh, uh, with every uh, week, uh, as you know, when we do this show, we've reached the point in the show where Jason has to hit a bunch of buttons in the right order in a short amount of time and has a high risk of screwing this up. So I'm going to hit one, two, and find the third one. That's the problem I always have. I can't find the third one. Here we go. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. Make creativity your business advantage. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornette Group. Find us online at teamcornette.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler. Our creative director is Jason Majeski. Associate producer is Ashley Harris. Our theme music is composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Thanks for joining us, folks. Until next time, I'll see you on the interwebs.